small and tiny flask and inside uh, there is one gold bullion I melted myself it's really far from being pure gold but really dirty alloy so this particular bullion uh, was made after etching uh, quite a lot of different contacts and thanks to that now I'm able to purify gold using 100 ml flask not a 5 liter flask also I put inside one watch case I'm not certain if this is actually golden case because it's not hallmarked uh, but it looks like a nine carat gold to me uh, so yes um, what I will make I will make poor man's upper region I'm making it for purpose uh, because I know a lot of people from Europe um, and I think it's the same in US uh, so a lot of people will struggle to get any kind of nitric acid but nitric acid, it can be successfully substituted uh, with any kind of its salts. And by saying its salts, I mean by any nitrate. Mix of absolutely any nitrate and hydrochloric acid, it will make almost the same thing as a proper aqua regia. Not exactly the same, but almost the same. Uh, well, from a practical point of view, it will be just less reactive. And uh, that's it. No any other major differences. So whatever applies to prop aqua regia, it will apply to poor man's aqua regia as well. Speaking about nitrate, you can use any nitrate. It will work to dissolve your gold. But... But I do not recommend using calcium nitrate. When it comes to calcium nitrate, if it gets mixed with sulfuric acid, it will make something called calcium sulfate, or in other words, gypsum. Gypsum is absolutely insoluble, and uh, also is quite hard to filter. I have applied five salts and two when I have it all set up, and hot plate heating. So, you can see the reaction taking place, and the gas being produced. And here we have nitric acid that's getting condensate inside. And this is going to work its way down into our collection vessel. And there we have it, our composted chicken manure nitric acid. Let's get out of there and transfer it over to a graduate cylinder and see how much we got. And here's our nitric acid. You can see some bubbling. Another thing I did, I fixed my glove to the flask neck. Some people may think I'm kind of a freak. Uh... Mm -hmm. 
purpose was to get rid of the inhibitor so that it would work with electrochemistry. To me, this looks pretty clear. Maybe a little bit yellow, but it's pretty clear. Let's compare it to... cells allow us to refine some silver, silver plated items, low alloy content, silver items work great in these systems. Um, but the real reason for them is we're able to process the waste from our silver refining in these two systems and pull out lead sulfate, um, nickel sulfate, 
We can get our tin and our zinc back by doing this process. Um, and obviously we receive back all of our silver. So the way that it works is our silver nitrate solution that we start with in the silver cells pretty much turns into copper nitrate once we pull all the silver out of it. So we can process three, four, five kilos of raw silver through this, get our pure silver out. Then we take our silver nitrate solution that's now full of copper, add more copper to it, push the rest of the silver out as a cement silver. Thank <laughs> you. 
So here, I'm adding back in the part of the solution that we set aside. another 200 milliliters of vinegar. And we're adding another 60 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. Now that we have so much liquid, we're going to drink the heat up a little bit. except of hydrogen, are uh, really useful gases. Both chlorine and nitrogen dioxide are actually the ones dissolving your gold, or helping to dissolve your gold. So myself, I'd like to keep them in solution as much as I can. From another hand, you cannot seal your aqua region completely, because soon or later so much pressure will build up, it will simply explode. Uh, so yes, this is what I'm trying to do to keep the gases in solution um, using really simple means. Again, no rush. Whenever you see some bubbling, just leave it like that. If reaction stops and you can see there are quite a lot to dissolve, at first I recommend to add extra nitrate. And only 
after adding extra nitrate, you will apply some heat. Since my flask is really small, all I have to do is just put it into hot water. If all of a sudden you realize uh, that there is a hole in the glove and some kind of unpleasant gases start coming out, no panic, it's an easy fix. Uh, just put another end of glove into water and uh, also you can add a couple of drops of ammonia or any base to that water. What it will do, it will nicely neutralize chlorine and uh, also nitrogen dioxide so your workplace will be times less smelly. Okay, this part it was done three days later. Not really I wanted or planned it that way. I just think we had another things to do. During this time, uh, everything dissolved, leaving just some dark grey black sediment. Aqua Ridge itself uh, changed its color from a tea color to a kind of green. Uh, this tells me that Aqua Ridge successfully decomposed because.
future expectations. This is not cheaper than buying potassium and sodium nitrates directly. This is just an alternative procurement process if you can't get those nitrates at all. If you can get them directly, then please share your source in the comments so other amateurs may benefit. So why would anyone want a potassium nitrate and sodium nitrate? Potassium nitrate is used in various pyrolytic uh, fertilizers. Yeah, it's used in fertilizers. Sodium nitrate is preferred for making a cheap and dirty version of aquaregia by mixing it with hydrochloric acid. This is especially useful for precious metal refiners as the sodium ions do not precipitate tetrachloroplatinate ions that potassium does. And the lack of calcium ions means sulfate producing reactions like metabisulfite treatment won't produce calcium sulfate precipitates. So these nitrates are pretty common in the inventory of most amateur chemists and metal refiners. If you can buy them directly, that would be easiest, so don't waste your time watching this video if you can. Usually process is the potassium chloride process, where we react calcium nitrate with potassium chloride in a double displacement reaction. Precipitate the potassium nitrate and filter off the calcium chloride. This only works with potassium chloride, but is unique and useful enough that it deserves its own separate section. So let's get started. You first need to identify exactly what you have. Calcium nitrate is commonly available in three forms. The most popular one seems to be calcium ammonium nitrate, which is calcium nitrate with a little ammonium nitrate mixed in. Other forms include calcium nitrate tetrahydrate and calcium nitrate anhydrous. There is a fourth form called calurea that has a lot of urea mixed in, but because of that it's much less valuable as a nitrate source, so I recommend avoiding that one and trying to find the other versions. To help identify, you can look at the fertilizer's NPK value and it's usually written right on the package. Each version of calcium nitrate has different NPK values that can be used to distinguish. You can set it and forget it, come back a few hours later, check on it, and um, you know, if the reaction has stopped or slowed down too much, you can change it out, replace the chemicals, start back over again. But it's a, it's a lot cheaper than nitric acid. And for those of us that can't get nitric acid, or nitric acid is just too expensive to use, this is a cheap alternative, and that's why it's called poor man's nitric acid. Okay, so it's been an hour. Deconstruct this piece of brass chemically. And I said I would rewrite the reactivity series. So, there it is. Slow down, three. You're going awfully fast. How do you know that golden... I measure up. I've seen silver precipitate out of an acetate solution before. So, it is possible. And then my rotary tool with the tungsten carbide was able to The file was really slow, and the tungsten carbide bit was really messy. So, I decided to try a hacksaw. The hacksaw cut okay, but it was starting to dull out the blade. If you do end up with a clog, just... nitrate into sodium or potassium nitrates just so they don't have to deal with calcium sulfate. Once we have that, we can plan our synthesis. 
I've created a table with the molar masses of each version, but more importantly, I've included the molar nitrate equivalent. The molar nitrate equivalent is the amount of substance needed to produce one mole of nitrates. This massively simplifies the calculations as you just have to calculate the number of nitrate equivalents needed for a reaction, rather than try to balance a stupidly prime number like 11 nitrates in an equation. Once we have that, we select our alkali cation, potassium or sodium. As said before, potassium is preferred for synthesis and shelf-stable oxidizers as it's non-hydroscopic. Well, sodium is preferred for alternative aqua regia mixtures because it lacks potassium. This table shows various potassium or sodium alkalis and their appropriate alkali molar equivalents. All you do is match up the quantities with the equivalent calcium nitrate, scale to the size you want, and mix. Then you filter and dry the filtrate. You might be wondering why I don't include sulfates and phosphates on this table, even though they would work. Sulfates and phosphates have lower solubility than carbonates, so you need more water. Considering how easy it is to water is necessary because there's no silver involved. Um, I, I can use this process with silver, but you have to use distilled water, deionized water for that, or you will create silver chloride in the process. Okay, so here's a quick rundown. Okay, I've added the tap water to my beaker. Okay, volume is very important because water can only hold so much dissolved salt. Okay, so we're going to be adding salt to it as a nitrate. And we want to dissolve the base metal that's there. So after the amount of water is saturated with salt, no more dissolved. It doesn't matter if you add more acid, it doesn't matter if you add more nitrate. Um, once the volume of water is saturated with salt, it, won't, it, it just stops dissolving, it won't dissolve anything else. So you have to start the process with this in mind. You want to add enough water to absorb the salt. Now, as much material as I have in here, it's going to be more metal, it's going to create more salt than this amount of water is going to be able to hold. So, about midway through this process, I'll have to remove um, the solution and replace it with fresh water and fresh acid. So, keep in mind that if you add too much of either sulfuric acid or you add too much solid nitrate you're just going to be wasting chemicals because there's only a certain amount that it's going to be able to hold in the end so you want to be Some procedures use a large molar excess of sodium bisulfate to improve yield. So I'm trying that here using 43 grams of sodium nitrate and 150 grams of sodium bisulfate, which is a little over two molar equivalents to the sodium nitrate. Hopefully this will drive the reaction forward and improve yield. I said before that I'm using sodium bisulfate monohydrate and not anhydrous sodium bisulfate. There's a good reason for that. Strictly speaking, this method isn't entirely dry. It requires that one of the reactants melt and react. Anhydrous sodium bisulfate melts at 315 Celsius. This is a very high temperature, and most lab heating equipment strains to get that high. 
while it's very possible to achieve, it would be much easier if we could use more modest temperatures. Sodium bisulfate monohydrate melts at just 58.5 degrees Celsius. So we just need to reach the boiling point of nitric acid, which is modestly higher at 120 degrees Celsius. We don't need to reach 350 Celsius. So try and use sodium bisulfate monohydrate for this procedure, and if you only have anhydrous sodium bisulfate, then it might be desirable to add one mole equivalent of water to bring down the melting temperature. If you're unsure of which heck you have, then just try melting some sodium bisulfate on the hot plate by itself. If it requires more than 100 Celsius, then you know you'll need to add water. Anyway, looks like our second procedure is done. I'm going to set that aside now. Now I'm going to try the wet chemical methods. To 150 milliliters water, we add 43 grams of sodium nitrate and 75 grams of sodium bisulfate. And then we stir until dissolved. Now we set up a distillation apparatus and distill over the nitric acid solution. By dissolving the reactants first in water, we ensure they have a chance to completely react. And so we should get higher yield than the dry method. At least that's the idea. Dry methods sometimes work just as well as wet methods. You might be wondering where I got my sodium nitrate. I should do it. and extract the nitrates out of the dirt and make it into nitric acid. We're going to be using a very quite straightforward process that's been used for hundreds if not thousands of years. We're going to exploit the uses of nitrates as a soluble material 
and use water just to extract it out. This is the same method that the Chinese did, the Greeks did, the Romans did, and many, many other ancient civilizations did for the last millennia and more. Now what I have here isn't just regular old dirt. It's poop. Now, poop is much better than just regular dirt for extracting nitrates. Now, this isn't just regular human fecal matter, it's chicken fecal matter. It's chicken. I love space master, and this kind of building is highly recommended. We switch that now. We, all we need to do is to cover this material with 29% oxygen. started to react because of pain and then it's highly soluble and soluble with hydrochloric acid so we can help it. And since our fire charcoal here has ready, we put our beaker here for our fire charcoal for heating. We need only 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. And this side, and this side, the solution slowly changes the color, you see, getting dark. So we keep it like for 5 or 10 minutes, and then we wait another 3 hours till everything settles down. Right now, we participate, you see this, everything gets brown. Bottom is still light. That way we do participation. So now we will just keep it. Comprises the whole system here. These first two cells um, are silver cells, and they have silver nitrate solution in them. Too long story to explain why, but let's say I just don't like it. Right now I'm using magnesium nitrate, not because I like it, and not because I'm supposed to use it, but just because I got it cheap. So yes, I'm just mixing it with hydrochloric acid, and if it will be not enough, um, I just add a bit more nitrate. Just waiting till all of nitrate dissolves, and um, then we will have a look how it goes. At this point, you don't have to apply any heat, just wait. At first reaction, it will be exothermic and it will produce quite a lot of heat itself. Even now it's winter time, but heating it straight away, it's a bit overkill. Just a couple of minutes later, and now we're left with copper nitrate. So then we take the copper nitrate, we add the proper amount of sulfuric acid to it, 
the copper nitrate turns into copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is used in these cells. But in that process, it liberates the nitric acid. So by using distillation in that process, you drive off all the nitric acid and you can capture it. It can then be reused, however, you know, back in the first two cells. Nitric acid is one of the more expensive components of all silver refining. Okay, so let's start here with the number two copper cell, or what I call the dark horse. Because by the time this uh, is ready to be changed out, it'll pretty much be a very dark green, almost black solution. The way that this works, and you can put almost anything in there. Um, I've run antimony, tin, copper, nickel, zinc. I'm still testing some other materials, but the way that it works, The anode is simply a copper wire that's run to the positive of your DC supply. solution is it's evaporative so the system gets pretty warm and quite a bit of the water is going to evaporate out which is condensing down your copper sulfate solution which is part of uh, it's part of the waste treatment process of this but one thing you'll want to do or very close to four nine silver the number two silver cell is for 90% silver alloys. So, you know, obviously 925, you can run 80%, even 50 50 silver and copper. You can run it in here. You're just paying attention to the color of your solution. As the solution, what you'll find, um, as the solution darkens, the reaction takes place faster. There's better connectivity. You'll, you'll notice it um, on your power supply and um, you'll actually process more silver as the solution gets enriched with other contaminants, nickel, copper, lead, tin, zinc, um, all end up in this solution and it actually gets quite dark. So that's kind of why I refer to this as the pale horse and this is the white horse. And out of the pale horse, we're getting 99, 8, 99, 9, almost always 99, 9 in the beginning of any refining in here until the solution gets to be about this color, darker than this. You're still getting three nines out of this for sure. Somewhere kind of in between here, there is a point where you start to get 9, 9, 8 uh, silver out of here, which is why I have two. So anything that's maybe questionable. Now, if I run this dark, you'll start to see copper plate out even. Uh, you just start to notice a little bit of brown streaking, typically over here on this side of the cathode where it connects. Um, so we want to obviously change out that solution before it gets to that point. If you let it go past that, it's not a problem. Then just we'll rerun it and you'll end up with 4.9 silver. Now, the interesting part though, the re to neutralize any nitric acid. And uh, finally, we should be ready for gold precipitation. 
But this time I will use SMB. Okay, I'm a bit lazy to start checking the pH level and uh, so on, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but from my experience, I hope I did everything right and called the precipitate just fine. How much of SMB you may need? Honestly, there is no certain answer. It all depends on too many factors. Myself, I would add anything between one to one of expected gold, uh, or at most uh, three times more of expected gold. Anything less, and you are in trouble. Anything more, and you are in trouble again. So, if you have no clue how much gold to expect, you better use iron sulfate, and then you will have more stable results. Just dissolve SMB in water, leave it to stay for a couple of minutes, and... Thing to it, I could use it as is, but if I want to use this for electrochemistry, I believe that the additive may impede its performance. Here you can see we're just getting to right around 200 degrees Celsius and not much higher. I may have to see if I can alter the super scientific hot plate to reach just a little bit of a higher temperature. Another thing that I used this brand of drain cleaner for was to make nitric acid. And again, I could use it as it was and it made pretty decent nitric acid. Anyway, here you can see it's actually boiling, regardless of what my thermometer says. Here you can see that the uh, fumes started to get really pronounced again, like they were before. And I'm sure at this point, most of the water, not all, but most of the water is fine. Nitric acid and sodium bisulfate are corrosive. Wear gloves when handling them. 
These reactions also produce toxic nitrogen dioxide gas and should be performed outside in the field. Greetings, fellow nerds. In this video...
do our first precipitation. And we've got 18.8 grams of 10K. Here's our 12K stuff in this bag. It's a combination of 10 and 14. The zero scale. I'm going to add this right on the end. And you can see we've got 13.1 grams of 12K. And now what we'll do is add the full... Now, depending on what may be in your material, um, you may see a reaction start. But this is, it's not actually dissolving anything. If it's got some uh, lead solder in there or something like that, sulfuric acid will react to the lead. Uh, dilute sulfuric acid will be called a little bit of a reaction, but it's, it, it, it's just a superficial reaction. It's not really dissolving anything. It's just... Reaction is, is 
is going strong. So now we got reaction bubbles. We got this small, little small reaction bubble going. It's, it's telling you that it's uh, it's dissolving the base metal, and um, you can see the gold foils is being released. Um, you know, you got foils that's just uh, flying around in there, and uh, this will proceed the way it's going now. Uh, and, and either um, one of two things will happen: either the base metal dissolves and the reaction stops, or the solution gets saturated and the reaction stops. So, you know, it's not like it's gonna. You can mess this up. You you really have to have some kind of bad mishap for this to go wrong. And whereas you got AP, AP will take you know weeks. You can get this same amount done in, in hours. And it's a process that, you know, I've been kind of keeping to myself. I don't, I didn't like to share it. But, uh, you know, I've used it. I've, I've been using it myself and I thought it was time to share. Um, so, this is, uh, this is one that's nearing completion now. So, you know, you can. Materials left behind by the chickens. The way to recover your precious here in acid is to place them back to just take your number two copper cell or nitrates. And after you've run as much copper as you can through it, filter the solution, then we'll add a platinized titanium and more copper wire by using the same material. Connect to the DC power supply and turn on at a high voltage. This will drive all the remaining metal out of the sulfuric acid, leaving you with pure sulfuric acid. I'll jump forward to the process of pouring it back in and do this cycle a couple more times. Well, at least the beaker didn't break with everything in it. It's warm enough to pass it through one more time. you can see a large hunk of sodium sulfate. The problem with all that sodium sulfate is that it may trap reactants inside of it. I'm not sure if it's a significant problem, 
But one of the methods I've seen for making nitric acid is to crystallize out the sodium sulfate before distillation. I'm going to test that and mix another batch of 43 grams of sodium nitrate and 75 grams of sodium bisulfate in 150 milliliters of water. The sodium sulfate is very soluble in water at room temperature, but becomes dramatically less soluble at cold temperatures. So we're going to remove a large portion of the sodium sulfate by taking our mixture and putting it into the freezer for a few hours. And here we are. So much of the sodium sulfate has crystallized out that it's almost like a slush. Now we suction filter the mixture as fast as possible before it had a chance to melt again. Interestingly enough, the crystals of sodium sulfate contain 10 mold equivalents of water. Crystallizing sodium sulfate decahydrate removes a tremendous amount of water, and that's why the volume of crystals here is so large compared to the original chemicals that we had earlier. This also conveniently concentrates our nitric acid for the subsequent distillation. And here's our filtrate. It still has some sodium sulfate in it, so we'll need to distill our nitric acid. Now distill until we reach half volume and then stop. When it cools, I'll put it back into freezing and again filter out the crystals of sodium sulfate. There's still a lot of sodium sulfate in the solution and we need to keep removing it. But once again, we distill the remaining filtrate. But since there's such a small amount this time, we're not going to freeze it again and instead distill all the way to dryness. And here we are, our four products from our four attempts. Now we can't directly compare the yields because they're going to have different concentrations. Even the dry methods don't produce pure nitric acid as the sodium bisulfate monohydrate will release some water when heated. And this will not be consistent between runs. Fortunately, we can crudely calculate the concentrations by finding the densities of the solutions and checking them against tables of separate beaker and we repeat the process of the large beaker again and again okay, until so we concentrate here, all of our pee into a very thick black mass of concentrated urine. At this point I further concentrated the concentrated urine by pouring it back into the larger beaker and boiling with so much dissolved salt. Okay, so we're going to be adding salt to it as a nitrate. And we want to dissolve the base metal that's there. So after the uh, amount of water is saturated with salt, no more dissolves. So it doesn't matter if you add more acid, it doesn't matter if you add more nitrate. Um, once the volume of water is saturated with salt, it, won't, it, it just stops dissolving. It won't dissolve anything else. You have to start the process with this in mind. You want to add enough water to absorb the salt. Now, as much material as I have in here, it's going to be more metal. It's going to create more salt. And this amount of water is going to be able to hold. So, about midway through this process, I'll have to remove um, 
the solution and replace it with fresh water and fresh acid. So, keep in mind that as we hit the 360 degrees, we can see the density of what we're discussing has completely changed and no longer sinks to the bottom. The process is not very much. We're just going to be waiting for the chemical. At this point, we're no longer distilling nitric acid. Shut the heat off and allow the steel to cool. What's left in the flask is molten potassium sulfate, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. Make all of my nitric acid. I didn't bother testing if the wet method would give similarly high yields with increased sodium bisulfate, because at 95%, the most improvement a new method could give is just 5%.
acid concentrations, and the results are very interesting. It seems the yields are not dependent on which method is used, but more on the quantity of sodium bisulfate. The wet methods seem like a non-starter. They produce slightly higher yield, but are too dilute. Even using the labor-intensive freezing and filtering process only improve the concentration, but actually hurt yield. While I'm sure they can be improved by adjusting the water added, it seems the dry method using two mole equivalents of sodium bisulfate is best. I'm actually quite surprised just how high the yield is. At around 95% this is competitive with using sulfuric acid. Since sulfuric acid is somewhat valuable for the amateur, if you don't need pure hydrous acid and can tolerate 75% concentration, then using very cheap and easy to acquire sodium bisulfate may be preferable. A minor bonus is that both reagents are dry. Welcome back to my channel everyone, Street Tips here. And what I've got here is a collection of stuff that Mr. Street Tips has been hunting for the last couple weeks. And then we're going to do a uh, finding do on the gold that's in this material. And uh, as I do this, I'd like to talk about a couple of things here. Number one is... Uh, I've had people try to ask questions about refining on my eBay messaging system. And as I pointed out before, I cannot answer questions about refining on my eBay messaging system. If you want to ask questions, uh, make sure and ask those questions. In I don't know if you can see it, feel me. Oh, 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 Nitric acid. Easy to Smoke coming off of that. Kind of. To the top of your screen. That's nitric acid coming off. And what this is right here is this is a solution of phosphoric acid and potassium nitrate. And we're getting nitric acid steaming off the top. Beautiful. It's a brand new thing. Nobody's done that before. Because everybody thinks you have to have sulfuric acid to make nitric, which is untrue. So, like I was saying. All right. So... You don't have to have an acid stronger than nitric acid to make nitric acid. Any acid you add to nitric, you'll get an equilibrium with a little bit of nitric acid, a little bit of phosphoric, whatever acid you have. Nitric acid. 
so you see the, the smoke coming off of that, kind of, for the top of your screen. That's nitric acid coming off. And what this is right here is this is a solution of phosphoric acid and potassium nitrate. And we're getting nitric acid.